So uh, Zach, thanks for having us today. Kim, thanks for setting everything up. I uh, just want to introduce myself and the team here at Arrow. So Teresa um, is our chief technical officer at Arrow. Teresa has been with the company since day one, and she's been so instrumental in bringing the benefits and the product of foam glass aggregate into the U.S. construction market. She really is our, you know, the lead uh, technical officer here, and she knows it's about everything there is to know about foam glass aggregate. <clears throat> so Teresa will be on the call today to answer any questions. John will also be here to answer questions. So John is based uh, as technical sales manager based in Orlando, Florida. And together, John and I um, handle all of the foam glass aggregate sales that are going into buildings or structures and really building on envelopes. We're very focused on the building envelope usage for a foam glass aggregate. My name's Travis Ogilvy, I'm a lead AP. Um, and then again, I'm focused specifically on using foam glass aggregate and building applications, sub slab insulation we're gonna talk about today. And we're super excited to tip today to reveal our newest line of material, which is our graded foam glass aggregates, which is our sand and aggregate size aggregates. So half inch and minus. And these materials we've been working in research and development for a few years, bringing this material to market. And I'm going to reveal some of the, some of the attributes and some of the um, uh, uses for this material in the presentation today. So that's our team. Again, as I mentioned, AeroLite is our new air, uh, graded aggregate material. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. But in the presentation today, I'm going to cover the company, who we are. I'm going to cover the products, what we're making, the applications and usage for the product. And there is some testing. I'm not going to get too heavy on the technical end of it. But we do have, I do have some really interesting testing, some thermal analysis, and some recent testing we've done on cured concrete with foam glass aggregates. So it should be exciting. A lot of fun stuff. Again, John and Teresa are in the wings to answer questions. Please put any questions in the chat box and we're gonna stay with you all day today until we answer everybody's questions. So let's start at the beginning. This is our, this is, uh, I love this photo. This is an aerial photo of our original plant just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And you can see here, these are mountains of foam glass aggregate. At this plant, at our, at, in Eddystone, Pennsylvania, we have three kiln lines. So three kiln lines are producing, each kiln line is producing roughly 80,000 yards of material per year. And again, we have three kiln lines. You can just literally see the mountains of material here. And the cool fact is if you can envision all this, all this glass was going to the landfill. Every bit of glass that we use to make our product is being saved from going to the landfill. We'll get into it a little bit further in the presentation, but the glass collet that we utilize has no, uh, no real, really no commercial value outside of our application. So it, it is literally going to the landfill. So uh, we're really proud of what we're doing and how we're, we're saving this material from landfill. And we're making it into a functional aggregate that can be used in more and more building applications. So great photo here. Now, what are we looking at in these mountains? I'll go back and show you these mountains. And here, this is what the aggregate looks like. So this is what comes off of our production line. And we will get into the process and how it's made and what comes off the line. But just to give you some sort of scale. So the average particle size is between an inch and a half and two and a half inches. So we're looking, I put the two inch uh, graphic there to show that's an average particle size. You can see to the left of it, there's, a, there's a, a chunk that's maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little more rectangular and square. But the irregular shape and the frick, the angle of, of these ag the aggregate is very important. So we'll get to that later. The, the friction angle allows it to com compact and, and be able to take, uh, be a load bearing surface. So the irregular shape, the angular shape is all super important. But this is what we're looking at. This is what comes off of our production line. We refer to these rocks as our G15. So G15 is the product that comes off of the line, again, in these larger gradations. So let's take a closer look at the G15. Again, foam glass aggregate, as you can imagine, it, it's pure silicon dioxide. I like to call it aerated silicon dioxide because that's kind of what it is. If I'm looking at this chunk in front of me, this the area within this, this rock or this piece of aggregate is on average 65 to 75% air. So it's, it's super lightweight because of that ultra lightweight, meaning that it's 85% lighter than standard aggregate. So we're running at 15 pounds a cubic foot on our technical data sheets. 
15 pounds of cubic foot allows for a little bit of moisture to be on board in the material and it's bone dry state is closer to 12 pounds of cubic foot. But we, for the, we use the value of 15 pounds of cubic foot. The, you know, the area within it being air, the, the, the unique fact is this is a closed cell material. So if those, all those little air bubbles that are in, be, in the center of this aggregate are not connected. So that makes it a closed cell. So this, this has a lot of attributes, but number one, it's the insulating factor. It's a really good insulator. It's insulating because of the air that's present, right? So it has an R value of 1.7 per inch in the dry state. And we'll get into that a little bit more when we look at the actual thermal analysis. With moisture on board, that lowers the R value slightly. So if it's soaking wet, it, it has an R value more of 1.2. In the dry state, it's 1.7. The high friction angle, again, super important. This irregular shape allows it to, to compact together. The average friction angle is 55 degrees, which is very impressive. And again, it's irregular. So the material locks together. It has really great interlocking properties. Frost resistant, it's frost resistant also because of the air. When you're frost resistant, meaning that the material is not gonna degrade or break down. Water can weep, weep in, water cannot really weep into the surf, into the interior of the aggregate because the it's closed cell. So those bu air bubbles are not interconnected. If they were interconnected, the water could get into the, all the way to the inside, then freeze, expand and crack the aggregate. It's not the case. The water can, any, our water absorption values are largely talking about the water at the surface of the aggregate, not within the core of the aggregate. So frost resistant, Material can get wet, it can, it can freeze, it can thaw out and freeze and go through these cycles and you will, it will not degrade the aggregate structurally. Capillary break, this is super important. We're gonna talk about this in the sub-slab insulation application. Basically the water is flowing freely through it. So if we, we take this aggregate and we compact it to say 12 inches in thickness, um, the, it's, it's free draining. The, the water is flowing through it it's it, so in sub in a sub slab insulation application, it's below the slab. Hydrostatic pressure pu pushing up below the slab, it, the, the, the aggregate's going to allow for the water to flow laterally underneath the slab and not be able to develop any serious hydrostatic pressure, which then would force the water up into your basement up through your slab. That's the essence of a capillary break. Load bearing, it's a structural material, right? Silicon dioxide, it, it's pure mineral. And so it, we're capable of load bearing. We do quality testing. We know exactly how, how much loading can be um, placed on the aggregate. And of course, it's a function of the thickness. How much aggregate do you have, right? So, and we, we can run these calculations for you. So that's just a quick overview of what the material is and what it's doing. Talk a little bit about our company in general. So. Aero Aggregates is, was proud this year to announce in 2022, in April, we opened our plant in Donnellan, Florida. This was our second location. Uh, first plant, again, we were founded in our first plants in Eddystone or Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We just opened Donnellan, Florida in April, and we are going to be opening Modesto, California in Q1 of 2023. So we're just about there. We'll be commissioning equipment just after the holidays, and we're going to be putting out rocks in Modesto, California. Q1 of 2023. I'm also proud to announce today that we will be announcing in 2023, I'm not at liberty to say it at the moment, but we will be announcing our fourth location. And that's kind of coming up and in 2023, we'll be announcing that in Q1. So let's talk a little bit about how we're making foam glass aggregate and what it is in general. Now you'll see this nomenclature in a lot of our literature, ULFGA, which is an acronym for ultra lightweight foam glass aggregate. So that's the material and that's the acronym for the term. We use it quite a bit. What we're looking at here, this is our first kiln line in Philadelphia. And it, interesting story that uh, we located the plant in, in, in a over a hundred year old facility. Called, it was the old Baldwin locomotive steam engine facility located right on the Delaware River south of uh, uh, Philadelphia. Very cool plant. So we basically repurposed an old building and located our, our plant inside it. So let's talk about the material. So foam glass aggregate is made from post-consumer recycled glass. There's sometimes a very small stream of post-industrial uh, glass that comes on board, but mostly it's post-consumer recycled glass. And we use 100% recycled glass. So we, we, there's, no, there's no new material here. We, again, we are taking glass collet that it's going to the landfill. 
what does this glass call it look like? Well, it lot, lot, largely it looks like garbage. And I can tell you from experience, it also smells like garbage. So the, it's got a lot of the impurities. It'll have organics on board. And you, 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 know, you name it, we've seen it in the glass call it. So again, this is a grade of glass that's, that's going to the landfill. And it's going to the landfill because it's dirty, because it's contaminated, and because the particle size is too small. When you have larger chunks of nice, fresh, clean glass, no impurities, well, that, that material is somewhat in demand, right? That can go back to a glass manufacturer to make bottles. A few places it can go. When it starts to look like these pictures here, when the glass collet is in very small particle size, there, there's, there's really no commercial value to it, right? It's too much energy and it's too much effort to clean it, separate it in most processes, but our process is unique. So we do take this glass in and we do clean it. We have a pretty extensive line of cleaning we have magnets that are taking the metal. We have air classifiers that are pulling the paper and organics. And largely we're trying to get it down to a specification where the, um, it's a very low LOI or loss on ignition. Mainly we're trying to get the organics up. So we're taking the glass collet and we start immediately by cleaning it up a little bit and just getting out some of the impurities. Next step in the process is glass milling. So now I've taken that glass collet, cleaned it up a little bit. Now I've got pure glass collet. And now we're going to take that into our milling process. In the milling process, this is a closed loop system. So the material will run through the mill, run through the mill. And when it gets to the particle size that we want, which is 63 microns or less, that material will exit the milling system. If it's still too large of a particle size and it's above 63 microns, it cycles back up to the top and it continues going in the closed loop system until we get to the particle size we're looking for. And all we're after here is to mill the glass down to get, a, to get it to a fine flour or a fine powder. And that's the basis for the material that we're making. 100% curbside glass powder. So, that, so the powder that we get, the flour that we get, the glass flour is again from 100% recycled glass. So that material, that uh, powder then is added, is mixed with a fo foaming agent. And it's a very small amount of foaming agent. So 98% of the matrix is the glass flour. 2% of the matrix is the foaming agent. Cool story on the foaming agent. The foaming agent is also a post-industrial material. So we use silicon carbide as the foaming agent. Silicon carbide we get from recycled and recovered solar panels that are ground up. So we add um, that. So that's the step. So, the, so we have the, the flour, 98%, and we have 2% silicon carbide. Now what we do here is we lay this material down. So, so this is a dry blend. And I'd like to point out at this point that there's, there's our process is a dry process. Uh, the foam glass aggregate it has been and is currently being produced widely in Europe. There's probably over at least six to 10 manufacturers of foam glass aggregate in Europe. Some do a wet process, and, but most do a dry process. Wet process, uh, is, is a little bit different, S similar, similar process, but in a wet process, you don't achieve as much strength. So we, we chose the dry process. A dry process delivers a stronger product. A good example of this is in the concrete world. If you look at concrete, if you overwater concrete, or if you put too much water in concrete when you're mixing it, you're going to get lower strength concrete. And it's a similar situation here. Any, anytime you have a wet matrix, you then have to dry out the wet matrix. And that usually results in less strength. So we have a dry process. We take the, the glass flour with the foaming agent and we lay it down on a bed. And we lay down a bed that's approximately three quarters of an inch thick. And then it starts going through our kiln. As it goes through the kiln, it's seeing different heat signatures as it's going through the kiln. And basically what's happening is we are heating it to the point where the silicon carbide gets to a certain heat signature and it separates. You're release, You're separating the silicon from the carbon. The carbon then is released as CO2 and bubble. The CO2 bubble is what foams the foam, the glass. This is what this is the foaming agent. So you can see here coming out of the kiln, the material is roughly about two to two and a half inches in thickness. And again, we enter the kiln at about 0.75 inches. So it's foaming. It's foaming quite a bit. You can see here how it's foaming up. So we're coming out of the kiln. The kiln itself is 45 feet long. Then when we come out, we're on the, the, the same belt is on a cooling table. So it's really a cool process. It's thermally fracturing. So as, as soon as it comes out of the kiln, it's at 900 C, right? And then it's hitting the ambient temperature and starting to cool. As it's starting to cool, it's thermally fracturing. 
And as it thermally fractures, it naturally breaks up, break the larger cake breaks up just by coming off the end of the belt. It, it naturally breaks up into the G15 sizes, um, which is the inch and a half to two and a half inches. So I like to point out there's no additional processing here. So it just comes out of the kiln and it's naturally thermally fracturing. And boom, there we have G15. So that's, that's, the, that's it in a nutshell. That's how we're producing the foam glass aggregate. So let's talk a little bit about some of the applications today, especially for, for the crowd we're, we're, that we have on today. We're all focused on building envelope. We're all focused on building sustainable. We're, we're focused on insulation. And here's where we really can benefit the building envelope. Sub slab applications. So here's some pictures of Aero G15 as sub slab, app, sub slab insulation, I should say. So you can lay it down exactly like you would lay down typical gravel. You can see here on the picture on the right, you have a vapor barrier, you have your chairs, you have your rebar, and you're just gonna pour your slab directly on top of the foam glass aggregate. Again, it's capable of taking 20,000 PSF. So you have no problem loading onto, onto the foam glass aggregate. To point out uh, as in application, there's a compaction ratio. So it has a compaction ratio of 1.3. So on average, if you wanna place 12 inches, if you want 12 inches of compacted G15, you're gonna set in place about around roughly 15 inches. Then you'll come over it with a plate compactor and you'll compact it down and it'll lock together. This is the interlocking. It'll compact by that ratio of 1.3 and, and it'll, it'll interlock together. So sub slab application, what are we talking about here in sub slab application? We're talking about insulation and we're talking about drainage. So this is where I really feel like it's, it's super cool because now we are get, we're doing away with rigid foam insulation. So if, if, uh, if you're insulating, if you're putting XPS, a couple layers of XPS or God forbid EPS underneath your slab, here you can do away with this material and the foam glass aggregate is acting as the insulation and the drainage barrier. So on the left, you can see a typical detail. You have a slab on grade, your concrete slab, you have your rigid insulation, then you have your gravel for a capillary break, right? So off to the right, this is, this is the better detail here. So no foam insulation whatsoever. We're putting in um, foam glass aggregate as the sub slab insulation. And a little teaser at the top there, we're gonna talk about later in the presentation, in slab insulation. So I, I alluded to earlier that we have graded foam glass aggregate in, in fine particle sizes. This can be added to concrete and we're gonna get into this in depth, but it would only make sense that if you're going to have sub slab insulation, why not have the slab have some, some thermal properties rather than standard concrete has an R value of 0 0.08. And so that's just may as well be zero. So there's no value there. So by adding a little foam glass aggregate, you can raise these values right up. And I'll get into that. I just wanted to tease it out a little bit here. But sub slab insulation uh, and the capillary break all in one. So the picture in the middle there that says R20.4, this was a little display that we had at Green Build a couple months ago. And this just shows that if you have 12 inches of the foam glass aggregate, you effectively have R20.4. Uh, so this is a pretty good R value. And again, there's a lot of reasons besides the, the functionality of the insulation, besides the functionality of the drainage, there's a number of other reasons to use it. And I'll get to that further in the presentation, but I just wanna show just a quick, simple detail of what we're talking about here. Let's take a look at the thermal properties. So this was some thermal analysis we did specifically on the material. And, and so you kind of have a high and a low range here. So the high range, 1.68, 1.7, is the R value per inch of the material. Now this is R value in a dry form, in a dry state. If the material gets wet and, and gets uh, saturated, it lowers the R value because now you have water present uh, instead of air, right? So it's gonna lower the value a little bit down to 1.2. So that's sort of a worst case scenario, but we largely point this out because uh, in, other applications in our really in our, our initial and main application uh, in civil engineering and geotechnical applications, this is basically outdoor use, right? This is outside, this, this material is going to get rained on, you're gonna have drainage flows coming through it. You're expecting it to get wet. In this application, sub slab insulation, we're under cover, right? So there's a roof, typically, you know, nine times out of 10, there's a roof over it. So we're not, we're not getting rained on. You know, of course, you can have the, the water table push up into it from below, but you know, with proper elevation and built and and, and proper engineering, you wouldn't have 
that type of water coming through it. So safe to say our 1.7 is a good number to run with in, unless you think the material is going to become saturated. So I just wanna show a couple projects. Uh, past, this was a passive house project in Harwich, Massachusetts out on Cape Cod. And it, I like to show this picture. It's just a great detail, a uh, great kind of visual of how easy it is to uh, place the material. So he's here, he's just got a track excavator, small excavator, super sacks have a bottom dump spout and you're able to just put the material in place uh, very easily. So we'll get to more on the packaging and how we package the material but this was a passive house in Harwich, Massachusetts. And then, oops, sorry, here is the detail or the architectural rendering for the house. And you can see where they specified the foam glass aggregate. So they've got it below the slab and they've got it running up the exterior walls a little bit. Again, anywhere where you're gonna put XPS or foam insulation, you can replace it with foam glass aggregate. So this was the detail for that project. And then on the topic of details, we have a number of details uh, in-house. So wh whatever um, your specific condition is, you know, we can give stock details, we can tailor some of these details, you know, and we can really kind of work with your design team to make sure you're specifying, you know, it at the, in the material in the right places and you're specifying at the right thickness and you're gonna get the R value you're looking for. So do you wanna just run through a couple um, of our recent projects? So this was a Hilton Garden Inn in Camden, New Jersey, and they have it under slab. And what I wanna point out here is that this is, this, go, this I guess there's more of a commercial application, but they had to raise the, the elevation of this, of this building and ultimately the elevation of the slab had to come up. So th I believe they had to come up over two feet, something like 30 inches. So what happens is if they're, they don't have great soil conditions, so if you're gonna raise the elevation of that slab up 30 inches, if you were to put standard um, crushed stone in there, you would be introducing a heck of a lot of weight on top of the existing soil conditions. By using foam glass aggregate, it's 85% lighter. So you can, you can make up that elevation change. You can bring that elevation up those 30 inches and, and use you know 85 percent less weight. Well, that's a big deal if you know if you have bad soil conditions and you don't want to be driving piers, uh, you lower the static load right on the on the on the soil by using foam glass aggregate. So it's not always using it just for insulation. There are some other times when it makes sense to use it if you have again bringing up a grade and and uh, putting less load on the existing soil is a good example. So this was a Hilton Garden Inn in New Jersey. The other thing I like to point out in, in this photo is on the, on the photo on the bottom right, you can see a stack of, um, of XPS foam there. And in the shot above it, you can see there's a, they built a little box out for one of the pipes to uh, bulkhead off the concrete when they're pouring it. Well, and you can see all the other interferences there. Can you imagine how you would lay down in a horizontal application, two inch sheets of foam, foam in there? You'd have to cut around every single one of these interferences and, and you know, not only would it be labor intensive, it certainly wouldn't be very efficient. So if you have a lot of interferences, this, the, the, the ease of installation is not something to be overlooked. You can install it very, very quickly. Here's another example at the United States Tennis Association. This was in Queens. And you can see this, there's a lot of communication, cables going on here, conduits. And one of their concerns, and one of the reasons they chose foam glass for this project is they potentially have to access some of these conduits and cables after the fact. I believe they were considering cellular concrete on this project, but they decided they did not want to encase all of this conduit and all of this communication cables in a solid matrix. So the foam glass aggregate works great. If they have to access it down the line, obviously it's a lot easier to get to the conduits. So just a quick shot of, um, uh, how we're transporting and how we're, we're uh, shipping the material. So we package the material into super sacks, large super sacks. They're 3.4 cubic yards a piece. So 3.4 cubic yards in a, in a sack. We also deliver in bulk. One of the things that's great to point out is kind of our three six. We did this uh, bottom right slide for Earth Day. It's the, three, the Aero 360, where we're taking the post-consumer recycled glass, we're turning it into a functional aggregate, and then we're delivering it to the job sites. One thing to point out is the amount of trucks it would take to transport the material. Because the material is so lightweight, 85% lighter, 15 pounds a cubic foot, this means you can have less trucks. Less trucks on the road is something also not to be overlooked. 
less trucks is a big deal. So the most, most amount of material weight wise you can put in a, in a vehicle going over the road is 40,000 pounds. Well, standard, standard crushed rock is 100 pounds a cubic foot, roughly. So 40,000 pounds means you can only put 400 cubic feet or just under 15 yards of material. So you can only transport 15 yards of material and, be, and then you've weighted the truck out. With our material at 15 pounds a cubic foot, now that same 40,000 pounds equates to 2,600 cubic feet of material and 98 yards of material. So in one full truck, you can either deliver 98 yards of material or you can deliver 15 yards of material. Well, it, at the end of the day, placing these types of material is a volume game. You've got to raise the grade to a certain height. You've got to hit a certain elevation. You've got to hit a certain insulation value. So at, in the end of the day, weight doesn't mean a lot. Volume means more. How much volume are you placing? Well, if you're only able to ship 15 yards in a truck, you're going to send a lot more trucks, obviously, than if you can get 100 yards on a truck. This is really where I feel like the sustainability of the material, it, it's more than just using recycled content. It's more than just saving the glass from the landfill. It's, oh my God, I, I've cut the trucks, in, it, it, I've cut the truck usage by 85% to supply a project. So this is really huge for us. Now, I, we, we do a lot of big projects. We do a lot of civil engineering, we do a lot of road work, geotechnical applications. You know, these, these projects can be in the tens of thousands of yards. What we're talking about here, Passive House Alliance and, and, and building construction in general is smaller volumes. So one of, the, one of the rubs we've seen over the last few years is that, boy, it's expensive. I, won't, I only need 30 yards of material. I need 100 yards of material. The freight cost is so expensive to get the material. Sometimes the freight cost can outpace the cost of the material itself. So we've recognized this over the last few years. And in 2023, we're gonna announce, we're really excited to announce, we're gonna have a distribution network where we're gonna have material placed all around the country. So when folks call in Denver, Colorado and wanna do a small job or a single house, we'll have that material in that region ready to go. And also for lead points, this is important too, because now lead V4 allows that material can come from within hundred miles of the distribution center. So we're, we're, we're cognizant of this. We're trying to stay on and, and offer more value to our customers by having the material in the regions where the material is going to be located. So this is new for 2023, more details to follow, but we're super excited about it. Okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here, and I'm going to go into our new line of products called AeroLite. So this is our graded sand and aggregates. So let's go back to the G15 material that comes off of our production line. What we're doing is we're taking this material and over the past two years, we've been doing extensive research and development. Now we have the capability to take these G15 rocks, the roughly two inch size rocks, and we crush them down and we sieve them out into these six sizes that we hear. We have a G1 through G6. All of these sizes are below a half inch in diameter, all the way down to, to the fine powder, like a G1. So this material, um, again, is, has the same properties. It's the same chemical characteristics. This is foam glass aggregate, and it is still super lightweight material. We launched this line of material at GreenBuild 2022. We were at GreenBuild, and we had, you can see here, we had the picture on the left. We have our six sizes of AeroLite out for folks to see. And I'd like to show this picture of the brick uh, precast panel. So the, the precast, this brick precast panel was made exclusively with foam glass aggregates. So no natural sand or aggregates were used. So you can make concrete exclusively with aero aggregates, with aero light. You can, you, because, I'm gonna go back, because we have these six different sizes, you can basically any, engineer any type of concrete you want uh, under 5,000 PSI, which is, is more than enough for general, general construction practices. Because we have these, sizes were developed to follow ASTM grading tables. So it, it's really exciting. We're really excited to bring this to the market. And again, and we're just, just launching this material. Let's take a quick look at the technical data sheet, some excerpts from the technical data sheet from AeroLite. So G1 through G6, and I, I would uh, have you go over to the, the third column on the right or fourth column on the right, the bulk density. This is where it becomes very, very impressive. So let's start with the G1. You have a particle size from a number 50, less than everything's passing a number 50 sieve. So all this material is under 300 microns in size. If you were looking at a comparable 
quartz sand or any type of sand in this particle size range, you would be probably between 105 and 112 pounds a cubic foot. Here we're at 54 pounds a cubic foot. So we are literally half the weight of a traditional or natural sand in that, in that particle size. And it's very hard to be lightweight at a small particle size. So maybe, maybe, maybe I'm a material geek, but uh, um, it, it's, it's very impressive to have that low, low density and that small, small particle size. Then as you start to go up, uh, G2, rough, roughly 300 microns to 1.2 millimeter, 23 pounds a cubic foot. Again, a comparable particle size in, in, um, in sand or limestone is, is easily going to be 80 to 90 pounds a cubic foot. Now we're 23 pounds a cubic foot. And it goes on down the line, the G3, the G4, very, very, very lightweight, very low, low densities. So what are the applications for the material? Wet cast concrete, this is ready mix concrete, this is precast concrete, um, CMU dry cast concrete. So CMU block manufacturers, I got a slide coming up where I'll show you about a block manufacturer in Maine that's already off to the races making CMU block with aerolite. Dry mortars, panels, boards, and substrates. All types of boards and substrates can be made with this material as well. And I'll just go down into, I just quickly want to go through the, the, the different sizes and what they do, because the different sizes have different, different applications and different functions. So the G1 and G2, G2 would be interesting in, in um, insulating mortars. So insulating mortars, stucco systems, enhancing stuccos, bringing, if you introduce the G2 to a stucco system, you could go with it. How do you, how do you, I'll get you in my house. A thicker build size. So there's a lot of applications for the G1 and 2, and uh, at the bottom, product benefits. These benefits are static across all, um, all these sizes. So it, you're going to lower the unit weight of the product you're making. You're going to improve the insulation properties of, the, of what you're making. It better sound absorption. And we haven't discussed this, but uh, better acoustic performance. So the material absorbs sound, and, and it's a really great sound absorber. So uh, for instance, in CMU block manufacturing, and we've all been in the gymnasium where you can't hear yourself think the sound's bouncing off the walls. Well, if you make a CMU block with Aerolite, it's going to absorb the sound rather than reflecting the sound. Um, increase the recycled content value. So we, the material is 100% recycled content. So on average, in ready mix concrete, for instance, we can, we can have structural ready mix concrete that's 30 to 40%. Um, aerolite, that means that it, that concrete's 30 to 40 percent recycled concrete. So I'm just going to jump up to the G3 and G4, G3 and G4. Now we're getting into these sizes are more suited for, for, for concrete, for ready mix, for precast, and also CMU block manufacturing. So the, these are the two sizes uh, for those applications. And I get up into the G5 and G6. Now he, as the particles get larger, you get a little more insulation value out of them. So if, if I'm going to be making, say I'm going to be making a lightweight core material, or I'm going to be making a substrate that's going to absorb sound, I'm going to start to use some of the larger sizes in these materials because it'll drive a, it'll drive the density down a little more. When you drive the density down a little more, you drive up the acoustic absorption, and you of course lower the unit weight of the material. So get, I don't want to get down into the weeds too much, but I do want to share some numbers on some concrete mixes and some concrete work we've been doing here in the R&D department. So these, these are, for, these are uh, com this is compression test results and density testing results for wet concrete. All I have four different types of concrete here, four different mix designs. All four mix designs are made exclusively with aerolite, with aero aggregates. There's no natural sand, there's no, natural aggregate in here. This is only foam glass and you can see the value. So I'm at 40 at 4,700 PSI, which is a very strong value for, for functional concrete and construction. No sand, no aggregate. And this mixture was 76% recycled content. So 76% re recycled content. I've got no mine minerals or natural, natural resources in here. Um, and then the other one that's highlighted in the bottom is the lowest density. You can see a density value of 94 pounds a cubic foot. On day seven, I'm 3,400 PSI with 94 pounds a cubic foot. You can see here I creep up to about 30, 3,600 PSI, but that's a very low density value. Just for the folks out there that don't know, standard unit weight of concrete is 150 pounds a cubic foot. So now I'm 94 pounds a cubic foot. You can only imagine the implications if you're, if you're pouring a floor slab Say it's on an elevated deck, and you're now the unit weight of the concrete goes from 150 to 94. 
that's a big difference. That means the W10 I beam doesn't have to be a W10, probably be a W6. So it, it trickles down. You see a lot of benefits. When you get weight reduction in a building, it trickles down. Everything is less. You can use less and using less is being green, right? So that's the little, little, I just want to share some actual numbers here with you guys. So this is probably the most, some of the most exciting slides I'm going to share today. So this is ASTM C177 thermal testing that we've done. And this is thermal testing um, on cured concrete. So this uh, test is on structural concrete. And so this is actually one of the mixed designs. This is the mixed design that's showing here at the top at 4720. This is thermal analysis of that mixed design. So it's considered structural because it's over 4,500 PSI. And here uh, it's 5.3 times more insulative than regular concrete. So I have an R value of 0.412, which is an average of those three values. And so that's a big deal. It does, I mean, you're starting, the bar is so low to begin with, where you have 0.08, now you're 0.412. That's a big deal. When you're 5.3 times more insulative, if you do thermal modeling and you look at the mass of these concrete floor slabs and you run it at 0 0.08 and then you run it at 0.41, it, it's, it's night and day. It's incredible. So simply by adding a little bit of, of Aerolite to your ready mix, uh, you can enhance the performance of the floor slab. We talked earlier about in slab insulation. Well, here's the results. By putting like an average, a super sack of our material into each concrete ready mix truck, you're going to change the thermal performance of the concrete. And here are the numbers right in front of you, R0.412. Now, I take, I've taken uh, and I, tr I optimized a mixed design. So I took the standard structural concrete mixed design. And again, I modified it and I tried to ha have better thermal performance properties to it. Again, 100% aerolite, no natural sand, no natural aggregate. And here now I'm 6.8 time, times more insulative than standard concrete are 0.54 per inch. So almost over, over half an R value per inch. So this is, this is just massive. And this is really without even thinking about it, just by, by, by adjusting the particle size and by adjusting the dosing, I get even better thermal performance. So it's very simple to use, very simple to add to your ready mix, very simple to add to your slabs. So you know it just makes sense to me if you're gonna have sub slab insulation, why not have in slab insulation as well? Together, it becomes a system and it's really, really great performance. So finally, I wanna conclude with a block manufacturer just to show the fact that Aerolite is now commercially used. And this is a block manufacturer in Northern Maine, Jeunesse Concrete Works, owned by Chris Jeunesse and his brother. Great company. Chris has been taking the Aerolite material and he makes his comfort block system with it. The comfort block system is a very unique system. Whereas the comfort block system has, uh, in, has uh, spaces or voids for insulation. So you can insert insulation. So you could stack up a wall and then you could basically grout it with the Aerolite for additional insulation, or you could use other insulation materials uh, if you wanted. But the fact is the block itself now is six times more insulative than if you were to just make the block with natural sand or aggregates. What we're seeing here in these numbers are Chris submitted it for ASTM C90 testing to make sure that it's hitting the requirements for a CMU block. And this block, I should point out, is 55% recycled content. And he, he's actually reducing some of the Portland cement content by using slag. So he's got 55% recycled content. And there are the numbers, right? So I think, believe AS, I think C90 is looking for only 2100 PSI. He's 2470. He's got, the, um, he's got the density down below 100 pounds and the absorption is an interesting thing. So a lot of times, you know, the absorption, the surface absorption or water absorption of the face of the block is important. So because we're closed cell, again, we, are, we can deliver the lightweight attrib attributes without turning the block into a sponge. So it's absorbing a lot of water. So here he's passing the absorption requirements for, the, for ASTM C90. So have a look at Chris's website. It's really cool to see our product commercially used and building products. And we think it's just the beginning. So we're super excited about that and uh, bring the new material to the market. So thanks uh, for listening to my long-winded explanation of everything. Here's just a rundown of a couple bullet points on our material. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might, anyone may have. Well, Travis, thank you. That was really fascinating and um, uh, 
super interesting to see the also the application of uh, the aggregate in um, slabs. So I think there are lots of lots of questions that you've generated here with this presentation. So let's get let's get moving. Um, so um, uh, first up, we have uh, so I'll we'll put this in the queue in a moment. But but the the first few questions will come from Dan Daniel Hall, Zoe Kaufman, and Hans Bro. So Daniel, do you want to start it off? I know that I know that um, you're you have a couple of questions. Maybe one of them was answered in chat, but I th think it's okay to repost that question also, so that we can have a conversation now about it. So go for it. Okay, am I live? Am I live on the microphone, or do you yep. need to post? Sounds good. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think one question was answered that you don't have time to discuss. Was interested in the overall embodied carbon when we compare this to regular concrete. But I think my my real big interest in this is about you getting that local supply network. We're up in Toronto, Canada, a pretty big residential market up here, but we work in smaller scale, you know, up to sort of 30 unit MERBs. And so a local supply chain is absolutely essential to us being able to incorporate this product. And if it were here locally, we would be specking it. I'm uh, very impressed with what you presented. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, we recognize that. I appreciate your, your thoughts there. And it's coming to your town. It's coming to a city near you. And that's our plan for 2023. So we'll get it up there. I'm excited to start talking with you about it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Zoe, you had a couple questions. It's possible they were answered, but um, it, if not, please fire away. Hi. Um, yeah, I think most of them were answered. Uh, I'm wondering mostly about um, the limitations um, in terms of height and size of building. Um, if you could just comment on, you know, multifamily applications, um, or maybe there was an app, uh, an example that I missed that is large building, but um, if there are any considerations in terms of um, building large with this, especially the aggregate. Sure, no problem, Zoe. Yeah, good question. Um, so really, there are no limitations as long as you don't put the material directly under the load path, right? So what we say is, you know, you're not going to locate this under the spread footing. You know, you're going to you're going to load the spread footing directly down onto the subsoil with maybe some sort of a a, a barrier, but you're not going to as long as the foam glass aggregate stays d directly outside of the, the the building's structural load path. Um, then we're fine. So directly under the under the slabs, slab is no problem. You know, keep it out of the footing. You're not going to put it under structural piers. So you know, just you know, just keep it out from under the direct structural load path, and then you could build as high as you want, no problem. In in the aggregate and the concrete, um, again, really no limitations. We're getting you know, we can engineer concrete. You know, again, the limit, the cutoff is roughly 5,000 psi. So once we go over 5,000 psi. Uh, to go over 5,000 psi, we have to put, you know, the dosing really isn't enough to to make to move the needle on structural on um, the insulation value. So as long as the con the requirement for the concrete is not north of 5,000 psi, then we have no limitations. Got it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Zoe. And I and this this gives me a chance to to let everyone know that Zoe Kaufman of NREL and Carmel Pratt of Bright Power will be the co-hosts of our new series. It'll be part of the Pass Fast Accelerator live series is a series on Wednesday. We're doing a new series um, called Next Gen. So sort of inspired by 40 under 40. Um, and uh, so they're gonna be co-hosting that. We're really excited to have them join us beginning in January. Our next question comes from the host of our project showcase edition of Pass Fast Accelerator Live and that's Beverly Craig. So Bev, please take it away. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Um, so Bev's question is, had a couple of questions. Um, one of the, her first question um, was, are there environmental production declarations or EPDs available? Is the kiln fueled by natural gas? Good, great question. So uh, the EPD is, is in process right now. We should have it in the beginning of Q1. One of the reasons why we're we're um, a little slow in getting our EPD done is because we're changing our kiln technology, which plays into the first question. So we, we were running gas kilns in Philadelphia. We were running gas kilns in Florida. 
And those will be the end of our gas kilns. The, kil the kilns in California we're proud to announce are electric kilns, and we're gonna be running with electric kilns going forward. So, you know, it's to some extent, the technology of making foam glass aggregates is, is maybe outpacing the technology for the kilns a little bit, but now we're catching up. Now the kilns are electric. Uh, again, Modesto, California will run on electric kilns and all future plants will also run on electric kilns. So we're, we're doing everything we can. The technology to, to produce electric kilns is, is in its infancy. So it's just, just coming around, but it's there now and our suppliers have, have dialed us into electric kilns. So we're pretty excited to announce that. Awesome, thanks. And uh, uh, Beverly had another question. Is there a Pennsylvania company that has collected the end of life solar panels to provide to the product? We are constantly looking for the proper solar panels. So we are sourcing the solar panels here in the United States and we're consistently looking for more sources and closer sources for the material. We try to be regional. So, we're, so for the Modesto plant, we're trying to recover solar panels in California for use in the California plant. So we're trying to keep everything regional. We try to source the glass, call it regionally. We're trying to now, of course, source the recovered solar panels regionally as well. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Okay, next up is Hans Bro. Hey guys, I uh, guess it was kind of a question. I guess it turns into a question of um, a project that I'm working on currently. There's a, a single family pass file and we're doing um, foam glass sub slab from another manufacturer. And one of the things we kept going back and forth on, we love to do a shallow foundation with no vertical found um, vertical cross wall. And I'm just kind of wondering, is have you seen a, it used completely underneath a floated slab, maybe for a smaller project or something like that? We just struggled with a manufacturer to sort of find a detail that would work. Um, I think we came up with something, but we'd love to get more info from from uh, yeah, manufacturers absolutely. on that. Yeah, no, no, it, it, it's it's certainly possible, and we do have details for that. So um, uh, if we can connect after, you know, we can we can share some of those details with you, and we do custom details as well. We'll look at your specific project and. You know, we have a great team of engineers here. Or we're not putting engineering out on the street ourselves, if we, but we, um, but we know we can do it. We can generate the details and walk you through it, and it's absolutely possible. Super, thanks. Yeah. Great, thanks, Hans. Uh, next is uh, Sandra Roller. Yeah, hi, hi. Um, sorry for keeping my video off. I'm sick. You don't want to see me, Travis. That is was a really great presentation, and I'm super excited that it's finally coming to North America. My question was, and it has been answered by John, if you will be able to deliver to Vancouver. And it sounds like the soon to be opened California plant will be able to do so. Yeah, and I'll do you one better. We'll have a distributor in British Columbia very shortly as well. Oh, that is great. Yeah, Thanks. Keep it regional, that's for sure. Yeah, that's even better. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, John Snell, you're up next. Um, uh, so uh, my question had to do with um, keeping the temperature constant in a, um, a slab uh, and, and uh, well, passive solar uh, and many passive houses, the mass uh, provides uh, uh, of the concrete slab on top of insulation is used to hold the temperature constant. So higher density provides greater mass on a small volume. Um, is there a way to use foam glass to, to, to get high density mass to create, to provide greater mass so you hold the temperature constant? No, uh, we're going in the other direction. So, so we're, we're, we're reducing the density so you know it's going to have a it, it's going to have an effect on the thermal lag that you're mentioning. Um, so it, yeah, we're 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 going to lower the density. So I, I don't think it would be beneficial in that particular aspect, to be honest with you. Uh, thank, thank you. It's it's really a great idea, and I'm, my hats off to you. Really, I'd love to be able to use this. Yeah, we'd love to have you use it. I'm you know feel free to contact me, and we can talk more specifically about it for sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, John. Next up is Mick Woolley. Oh, hi. Um, so uh, what sort of depth of foam glass do you need for uh, a passive house level slab? I'm thinking of uh, domestic builds, sort of around uh, 200 square meters, something like that, uh, with a U value of around 0 0.1. So tip, the, if I were to pick an average, where the average thickness is 12 inches. So again, placing roughly 15 inches of material 
compacting it down. After you run the plate compactor over it, you're down to just about 12 inches of compacted material. And this nets you a little over R20. And that, that's, that, that seems to be sufficient uh, to, to meet the building code. And it's comparable to you know, lay a couple layers of foam insulation. So uh, I, would, I would, in most instances, as an average, I would say 12 inches of compacted material is, is a good starting point. Of course, every project's different and you, know, you could go yeah. more or less for sure. OK, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Mick. Next is Simon Ralph. Uh, hi, Travis. Thanks for uh, the, the presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit of, more about um, vertical below grade applications. Um, I, I th I'm kind of interested in, um, in the same way that, that uh, the, the foamed aggregate um, does a bunch of the functions that we typically achieve through layers of different materials. Um, below the slab that that and around the perimeter of the foundation um, can uh, accomplish the same thing both in in new construction and in, in retrofit applications yeah exactly it's exactly it i mean so you know anywhere where you're going to put xps foam so in, in a vertical application on the outside you can see, you remember the detail from the harwich project so you know you can it's a great it's a great use to put the material in vertical application on the exterior of the wall. You know, I'd say I would definitely recommend at least, you know, 12 inches out from the vertical face of the wall, you know, and bring it all the way up to within six inches of the top of the finished grade. Um, you do have to segregate that material with either a geotextile or some sort of textile fabric uh, so you don't get it contaminated with dirt. That, that way the, the water will flow through and you'll get the insulation properties uh, from doing it that way. And, and what, uh, what kind of lifts do you have to do it in to achieve compaction? I, you know, I, it, it's best to always do one foot lifts if possible. I mean, if you, you, you could possibly go up to 18 inches or two, two feet if you, know, if you had to. Um, I would say one foot lifts are the way to go. That's how I would do it. Okay, great, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Julie Blazik. hey Julie. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the presentation. Um, we're super excited about this product and we're, we were excited about the possibility of maybe a plant being located up here in uh, Northern Washington state. So keep that coming. Um, but we did have issues with the, the cost structure of it and transporting it from the East Coast. And it, it kind of wasn't even close to some of the board options that we had. So I was just curious about whether and I see you've answered part of the question, whether the price will come down as you start to get more closer regionalization to project sites. Yeah, I mean, that's 100% it. I mean, this is such a big topic. I mean, the, 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 the availability of the material regionally is, is critical, right? You, you can't be shipping the stuff LTL. It's just too expensive. Like I said, the cost, the freight cost will quickly outpace the material cost. So we're, we're, we're very cognizant of this. We're putting together a system where we wipe that away, where we have material on the ground regionally. We believe there's enough of an interest in the material. We've got some good partners and, and this is absolutely our focus for 2023 to have the material on the ground to make the, we need to lower the landed costs to your point. I mean, we absolutely have to lower the landed costs and this is our plan to do it. Awesome, can't wait, we'll, we'll use it. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Next up is William Jarvis. William, I see you on the list there. I'll wait a moment. See if you can unmute yourself. If not, I will ask the question on your behalf. Okay, so William's question is, using as sub slab aggregate, can it be over compacted? Yeah, yeah, it can be over compacted. So largely, it's only going to be over compacted if you're driving over it with large mechanical equipment. So this is we only really see this in in infrastructure projects where you know you might have a D10 run, running over the same track for you know three days in a row. <laughs> that that will degrade the material. That will over compact it. In residential construction applications, very unlikely. I mean, I guess you know if you get a had a jumping jack staying in the same spot for 20 minutes that would over compact it but other than that you're, you're okay great thank you okay ian small you're up 
It looks like he Ian is not on on the. Oh no, I see you. I see you've unmuted yourself, but we're not hearing you, Ian. I'll go ahead and ask your question for you. Okay, so um, talking of Toronto, are you on the ONC standards list? That is, are there any issues with pass passing building inspection in Ontario, Canada? We're not currently on the list, but we don't have any issues passing any type of inspection. You know, any any require any uh, engineering requirements or analysis of our material. If it hasn't already been done, if it's specific to a new project, you know, we have a great team of engineers on staff. We can we can get kind of any any analysis that we need, but we haven't um, really had any issues at all. I mean, it's it's very simple material. It's just pure silicon dioxide. So there's no coatings. There's no sizings. There's no leaching of any chemicals from the material. It's, you know, it's just a monolithic piece of silicon dioxide. So it's pretty simple to get approvals. Great, thank you. Okay, we have one more question from Doug Selby and then also one from Melvin Lau. Melvin had to go, but it's a question that he's requesting we ask in his absence and he'll look at the recording. I wanna just say that it, it, everyone on the call, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up unless there are other questions. So if you do have another question, um, now is the time to, to pose it in chat so that we can make sure we get to it. So with that, Doug, you're up. And I see Doug on the list still so he's here all right doug i'm going to ask your question for you and this is actually there's also a, a closely related question from liam kelohar um, so doug's question is uh, a clarification clarification question so you cannot use this material under building footings and then liam's question is even for domestic footings so it depends on the load. So it's not a no, it's not a binary answer. So it's not a yes or no. Uh, the loading, John, can you talk about the loading requirements, John? Yes, you can You can be used under the footing as long as the, the pressure don't exceed 2,500 PSI, you know, and you will have no settlement. You know, after that you will stay and, and had a little bit of creep over the 50 years. So we recommend not going above 2,500 PSI on that. Yeah, I had mentioned it earlier when the, I believe the, the, the lady was asking about very tall buildings. And so if you have, you know, dynamic loads coming down, then no. But, you know, in, in residential, you know, probably no dynamic loads or maybe, you know, so if we can work, you can work around it. You can also, you can also adjust the thickness, you know, a little thicker material, a little more material, and you can put a little bit more load on it. So, you know, if, if it's in question, we can take a closer look at the engineering involved. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so Melvin's question is, um, how can we connect our local garbage slash recycling service providers with you to increase recycled content of broken glass? Like Sandra, I'm in the Vancouver region. Um, I'll listen to the answer in the recording after. Yeah, I mean, we, we are always open to new sources for glass. So I would say I would certainly encourage anybody who, who ha has some source for glass, whether it's a MRF or there's some available glass, please email John or myself. We're always looking, again, we're trying to keep everything regional. No one knows where our next plants are gonna be. So we're trying to build a network of glass. So perhaps, you know, if we, you know, there's glass in Vancouver, maybe in the future years, there's a new, an aero plant in Vancouver. So please send any information about glass to us. We keep all this information, we compile the information and we have a great database about available glass in North America. So we encourage any information anyone can send us. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, next up is Reed Rollins, and I think that might be it. So again, if you have a question and you want it answered, type it in the chat. Otherwise, we'll close up with Reed. All right, thanks, Zach. Um, I was asking about the thermal properties between the G15 material and the Aerolite. Yeah, Are they the same. I guess they're under testing, maybe. Or? Yeah, no, it's 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 basically the same. You don't see we don't really see a loss in the therm uh, a reduction in the in the thermal properties until you get down below the G two. So the G six, the G five, the G four, and largely the G three are going to have the same insulation values. R one point seven per inch. It's oh. the yep. The material is, and you can see that in the bulk density. So the bulk density value again for the G fifteen, we we posted that fifteen ps at uh, uh, for uh, fifteen pounds a cubic foot but it's closer to 12 when it's dry. And you can see the G6, the five and the four, they're all at, they're all at 15 pounds a cubic foot. 
So it's roughly the same amount of air within the area of the grain, which that's the driving force for the insulation value. So it, it, it holds the same insulation value. It's great. Cool. One last quick question, since I'm like 20 minutes down the street from you, can I bring my recycled glass to you? Yes. Cool. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Good. That's great. Bring it up, bring it up. You can bring a few full, full bottles too. If you want. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a follow-up question about the California plant. Just clarifying, is the plant in California still supposed to open up next month? The plant in California is still supposed to open up next month or what's, what's the schedule for that? Yeah, it's going to open in sometime in the middle of Q2, so or Q1 rather. So the, the uh, equipment is being commissioned right after the holidays. So the commissioning will start. So we'll, we'll be opened up. Uh, let's just call it Q1, um, but it should be right in the middle of Q1 at some point. Again, equipment commissioning taking place in January. So we're pretty much on track. Fantastic. Well, I think that wraps up our questions. Travis and John, thank you so much for joining us today to present. Uh, um, you, there were lots of really great uh, compliments about your your presentation, as well as um, I think very um, excited folks about the about the product. Um, so this was a really great session. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today in our last event of 2022 for Passive House Accelerator. We'll be firing back up on the second week of January for the first episode of that new uh, next gen edition of Passive House Accelerator Live with Zoe Kaufman and Carmel Pratt. So we hope to see you that second Wednesday um, in the new year. Until then, have a wonderful holiday and be safe and be well. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Zach. Thank you, guys. Take care.